go live. I'm Richard and Toss. So good to have you with us. Let's begin with the United Nations General Assembly, which is holding a special session on the coronavirus pandemic with more than 64 million cases worldwide and the death toll nearing 1.5 million. The UN regards the pandemic as the international community's top priority. The two day special session aims to provide opportunities to assess and hone its collective response to the pandemic. A general debate will take place on Thursday and Friday and will include interactive dialogue with experts, UN agencies, leading scientists and vaccine developers. The goal is to examine the current pandemic response, identify policy and operation gaps and forge a united coordinated path forward. Nigeria's President Mohamed Buhari has come under enormous pressure to sack the country's military chiefs following the killing of at least 43 farmers in the northeast Borno state. Boko Haram has since claimed responsibility for the Saturday killings, which have elicited angry reactions across the country. CGTN's Deji Badmas has more on that story. It's very rare to see lawmakers from Nigeria's ruling party openly criticize the president on any subject. But this time, angered by the killings of the farmers on Saturday, the 28th of November, senators from Buhari's own party did not hold back, calling on the president to fire his military chiefs. And whatever it is that the security chiefs are doing presently is not working, or at least not enough. And if the president insists that the security chiefs are doing their work well, then the logical implication of such assumption is that the president, as the constitutional commander-in-chief of the country, has failed in his most rudimentary assignment of securing this nation. It is time for Mr. President to allow our service chiefs to go. They have done their best. They have worked so hard. The best anybody can give is his best. You cannot, you cannot give what you do not have. The tone was no different in the lower house of parliament, where after a rowdy session, lawmakers there passed a motion inviting the president to come before lawmakers to explain the security situation in the country. 24 hours after that motion, the speaker was at the presidential villa to personally pass on the message to the president. What we basically sought was um, to convey the resolution of the House and to fix a date, which we did not fix, uh, out of respect for Mr. President and his very, very tight schedule, what date will be convenient. And um, we have agreed on a date, and he will to the House um, to address the situation. Even when the President appears before the lawmakers, it would be the first time he would be doing so, other than the traditional budget presentation before Parliament. And it would be the first time any President would openly address lawmakers on security issues. I don't think the president needed the Senate or the House of Rep to spur him to come stand before them to now ask him what is he doing to quell the insecurity. I don't think also consistently retaining the service chiefs will do the president any good because it's like a football team. You cannot be losing matches with the same team members and then you refuse to make substitution. The current situation in the country is certainly not what the president or any Nigerian bargained for when this government came to power back in 2015. There were high hopes back then that being a retired military general, President Buhari was going to bring an end to the Boko Haram insurgency and secure the country. But those hopes are now fast fading away. Even the president's party men are beginning to question his own method. Dejabatmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. U.S. President Donald Trump is renewing claims of election fraud, and his former National Security Advisor, General Michael Flynn, is backing calls for Trump to overturn the Constitution. Timothy Ulrich reports. This may be the most important speech I've ever made. Trump attached great importance to a 46-minute address posted to social media on Wednesday. The U.S. president named a list of unsubstantiated claims that the November elections were undemocratic. It's a widely known fact that the voting rolls are packed with people who are not lawfully eligible to vote, including those who are deceased, have moved out of their state, 
and even our non-citizens of our country. Beyond this, the records are riddled with errors, wrong addresses, duplicate entries, and many other issues. Attorney General William Barr said on Tuesday the Justice Department had found no evidence of widespread voter fraud. Barr is the latest member of the White House and the closest to Trump to come out against the claims. The claims of voter fraud are growing outside the president's administration. General Michael Flynn, his former national security advisor, shared a press release on Twitter. It was from We the People Convention, an Ohio-based nonprofit, announcing they took out a full-page ad in the Washington Post. They urged Trump to declare a limited form of martial law and temporarily suspend the Constitution and civilian control of the elections. They say it'd be for the sole purpose of having the military oversee a national re-vote. Michael Flynn was pardoned by President Trump last week. He was facing charge Trump's campaign with pardons. On top of that, his legal team has suffered numerous setbacks and challenging results from the elections as the clock winds down on the votes being set in stone. Timothy Ulrich, CGTN. Well, let's turn our attention to Afghanistan now, where the government and the Taliban have reached a preliminary deal to press on with peace talks. It marks the first written agreement in 19 years of war. The deal, reached on Wednesday, lays out rules and procedures for the negotiations. It comes after months of talks in the Qatari capital, Doha, and marks a significant development as it will allow negotiators to begin discussing more substantive issues that could end nearly two decades of fighting, including a ceasefire deal. Now, the agreement has been welcomed by Washington, which has been brokering the talks. A U.S.-backed government has held power in Afghanistan since 2001, after the Taliban were ousted by U.S.-led forces. And back in Africa, al-Shabaab militiamen have stepped up their terror attacks in Somalia as the country heads to the polls. Earlier this week, the insurgents carried out a suicide attack in Mogadishu and a raid on an army base in central Somalia. CGTN Abdulaziz Billo has more from Mogadishu. Militant group al-Shabaab has claimed credit for Monday's terror attack on a strategic army base in central Somalia, the first large-scale assault on a military target in years. The government says 15 people, including soldiers and civilians, were killed in that attack. Al-Shabaab claims to have overrun the base, killing scores of soldiers before parading weapons and army vehicles they claim to have seized during the attack. Mogadishu says 51 insurgents were neutralized as the army regained control of the base. In the past month, the Al-Qaeda-affiliated militant group Al-Shabaab has stepped up attacks in major towns, including the capital, killing mostly civilians. The latest attack took place in Mogadishu at an ice cream parlor that claimed eight lives. Security will be delivered and we will bring peace back to Somalia. Uh, we are also going to bring to justice those who, are, who have committed crimes against humanity especially those commanders of al-Shabaab who have been uh, mercilessly killing our population. On Tuesday, the Somali Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Roble chaired a security meeting with the country's international partners, including the United Nations, European Union and the African Union. Stakeholders discussed ways and means to bring about peace and justice in the Horn of African nation, ravaged by decades of conflict and an armed insurgency by al-Shabaab and a pro- and effective governance of the security sector is not only crucial for stability, but also consolidation of democratization and sustainable economic and social development. All of the federal government of Somalia, this is the aspiration of Somali people. The country is planning to conduct general elections this month by a crucial presidential poll next year. Terrorist group Al-Shabaab has threatened to disrupt the process by threatening clan elders and electoral delegates. Presidential aspirants have also been meeting in the capital, Mogadishu, to pressure authorities to conduct free and fair polls. Meanwhile, as campaign kicks off in the rest of the country, security will likely dominate the agenda in the run-up to the presidential elections next year. Abdul Aziz Bilo, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. Well, half a million children in Burkina Faso are staring at hunger. 
the United Nations is warning the children are one step away from famine. The situation is said to be deteriorating due to a jihadist insurgency that has displaced over a million people. CGTN's Joy Karuki reports. Habibo Sore is lucky to be alive. She managed to escape while pregnant with her twins. They were displaced by violence from her home in Pisilla district in 2018. The day the attackers arrived, it was in the neighboring village that they started. We got the warning that they were on their way to us. We saw them coming with three motorbikes and two people on each motorbike. They went into the neighbor's house. They had already fled and they stole everything. We wanted to get out as well and I was the first to leave because I was pregnant. Now living with her uncle in Kaya in northern Burkina Faso, Sore is facing a new reality. Everything is different now from what it was in the village, even here in Pisila. Just to have the bare minimum to survive is very hard. We don't eat enough and we have nothing to live from like we used to in the village. Today, she is visiting this health center supported by the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, in Kaya. Her one-and-a-half-year-old twin sons weigh seven kilograms each, the equivalent of a healthy four-month-old baby. Sore is worried about their health. Some of the women here have been psychologically affected by the violence and attacks. So how can a woman who's psychologically affected get her child out of a cycle of malnutrition? So we have this kind of a situation, which is not easy at all to deal with. Not easy at all. The other day, I was pulling too much on this woman, and I asked her why she's always together with her child. She said, because my father-in-law always eats the child's rations. An influx of villagers fleeing violence in the Sahel region has seen the population of Kaya double in the last year and a half. Thousands have been killed during attacks by Islamist groups with links to Al-Qaeda in the Sahel. The attacks have worsened food shortages that threaten millions. World Food Programme figures show the armed groups have cut off access to supplies in farmland, affecting over 7 million people who face acute hunger. We've lost around 15 hectares of arable land for the cattle. We've lost around 60 heads of ox, without forgetting all our personal belongings. Those represent massive losses. We can't put an exact number to it. It just represents huge losses. Over half a million children below five are acutely malnourished, UN figures show. Over 10,000 people are one step short of famine, according to the WFP. Worse still, dozens of health facilities have closed, with another 200 operating at a minimum, government figures indicate. The conflict has also affected education. Thousands of children cannot go to school. For those who can, classrooms are overflowing and with few books. Teachers like Amadou Maiga regularly take the pupils through a safety drill in case of attacks. When we blow the whistle three times, the children know there is danger. And when there is danger, they have to throw themselves on the ground. And that is because we are in a classroom and children have to hide under tables and protect their heads. We do not shout. We do not speak. We do not cry. And also, we don't try to run away. The Norwegian Refugee Council has rated the situation in Burkina Faso as being worse than they have witnessed in the last decade. For those displaced, their hope is that the security situation will improve to allow them resume their normal lives. Joy Kiruki Juma, CGTN. In South Africa, the no confidence vote against President Cyril Ramaphosa has been postponed. The president was to face his first vote of no confidence in, in parliament this afternoon. The motion had been brought by the African Transformation Movement earlier this year before the coronavirus lockdown began. The ATM is accusing President Ramaphosa of failing to disclose to Parliament that he benefited from the CR-17 campaign, 
which financed his bid to become the president of the ruling African National Congress Party. All right, our reporter Angela Coppola is keeping an eye on these developments. He joins us live on the phone now from Johannesburg. Angelo, what's the latest? Well, besides the fact that they've called, uh, got that postponement, uh, I spoke to the president of the ATM, and he said it's a victory for them because they maintain that if there's no secret ballot, then there can't be a vote of no confidence. So they're waiting until the 3rd and 4th of February next year when the court will hear their full application, and then the courts will obviously reserve their uh, ruling. So we're probably only going to hear from the courts a couple of weeks later. So we expect that the no confidence vote will only happen sometime probably in March. And that's almost a year to the day, well, plus a couple of weeks, from when the ATM actually lodged their initial, um, their initial um, application. So, I mean, if you consider the fact that the, today's uh, vote was already going to be uh, avoided by two of the main opposition parties, that's the United Democratic Alliance and the, Dip the Democratic Alliance, those two parties have said that they're not interested in the vote because they consider it to be frivolous. That's the word from the DA chief whip. Um, and she says there's no need for it. There were more important things to be debating uh, because, as you probably know, Parliament in South Africa rises on the 4th for the Christmas recess and they're only back late in So it's not there before anything happens. It's ironic, though, because um, the no-confidence uh, vote was called for when the country was in crisis. The state-owned entities were all in turmoil. The economy was in a, sort of a suicide dive, and it actually got worse after that because of the lockdown that we went through because of the pandemic. So what it is right now is, quite frankly, it's a sit and wait, but it's ironic, as I said. Um, it is Ramaphosa's first no-confidence vote. His predecessor... Uh, survived eight of those votes um, before he failed on the ninth one. So we'll have to wait until at least February, maybe early March, before we know what the political future of the current president is, Richard. All right, Angela Coppola, we certainly appreciate that update and report. Thank you, my friend. Always a pleasure having you here on Africa Live. Time now for a short break. Here's a look at what's ahead. Fighting for the girl child in Africa. A look at the reality on the ground in South Africa. And a new finding reveals that the genesis of malaria infections among school children in eastern Uganda. Africa is a continent of diversity. With varied climates and enchanting geography. And a people so distinct but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Hi, Shirishi, Tunis, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to Africa Live. I'm Richard Nta. For years, organizations and governments have been concerned that girls in Africa don't get the same opportunities as boys. A new report by the African Child Policy Forum also shows that girls in many African countries are married off young fall victim to abuse and child trafficking rings and are often kept out of school. CGTN's Julie Shire puts all this into context through the story of a South African teacher fighting to keep girls in school. South Africa is among a handful of countries where it's compulsory for children to attend school. Clearly defined gender roles still, however, plague society. Johannesburg primary school teacher Tando Madonzela says it's noticeable from early on. When boys come in, they come in ready, they come in with that dominating spirit. But with girls, you need to work through it. It takes time. I think the society has done quite a lot to suppress a girl's confidence that a girl is just limited to certain duties, certain games as they grow older, to balance schoolwork and to balance even livelihood as well. It tends to be too much. 
Madonzella started Gorgeousness a year ago. It's a women's empowerment movement that helps children as young as 12 to gain knowledge and confidence. We've seen that other women, when they can't do it for themselves, they tend to just go for an option of marrying somebody just for security, just for that form of um, support financially, because most of them, they come from poor um, families. I've seen from myself that when I got empowered, when I got an education, I was able then to feed even my community. Africa is home to 308 million girls. In-depth research by the African Child Policy Forum found that many face a bleak future. Condemned to early marriages, child trafficking rings and governments are being called upon to do more to protect and educate girls. We really have to work with the communities, work with traditional leaders, work with the parents and ensure that we sensitize everyone about the value and the importance of education. We need to bear in mind that most of them have already have grown the primary schooling age. Therefore, we cannot uh, depend only on the formal education system. We need to come up with multiple kinds of solutions in terms of life skills program. An entire generation of African girls is being failed by discriminatory laws and harmful cultural practices. If these aren't addressed, many more are likely to remain trapped in a cycle of poverty. These girls are the asset that can help us to transform Africa. They are not the object for quick cash. We need to ensure that we look at the bigger picture, we look at the future. If we invest on girls, we will be able to transform the continent. If we invest in girls, we'll be able to address, we'll be able to break the continued poverty cycle that most of our communities are trapped in. Women and girls are worst affected by poverty and inequality. COVID-19 has added to these woes, further locking them out from proper education, job opportunities and quality health care. African countries will have to work quickly to ensure they do not lose gains already made. Chili Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Tunisia is taking part in the international 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence campaign. The authorities in Tunisia say violence against women has increased despite the legal measures put in place to stop the vice. CGTN's Adnan Shawashi has the details. The Minister of Women, Family, Child and Elderly Affairs has revealed that there were nearly 14,000 reports of violence since January 2020. These figures represented a sevenfold increase during the general lockdown and the COVID-19 pandemic. Violence against women is on the rise across Tunisia. It's alarming and unfortunate social phenomenon, which is characterized by beating and even killing of women. The statistics are terrifying, especially during the lockdown. We've extended the working hours of the toll-free number 1899 to 24 hours on all weekdays. Another toll-free line, 1809, was set up for the psychological care of families, especially women and children. The minister emphasized the responsibility of all parties in the fight against violence against women, as well as the importance of combining efforts to combat all forms of gender-based violence. Tunisia places the fight against violence against women among its sectoral and national priorities. We have established the National Observatory for the Fight Against Violence Against Women and created security units specialized in this field. The state also created many regional coordinations which provide assistance and care for victims. Civil society associations and organizations have called for a proactive and comprehensive approach to combat violence against women based on prevention, education, on human rights, equality and non-discrimination. As part of its support for partnership with civil society, the Tunisian government has set up reception and accommodation centers for women victims of violence and their children. A government decree organizes these centers. We are raising awareness about gender-based violence and informing women about their rights. The Interior Ministry has created 128 units to counter violence against women. Authorities say they have received 65,000 complaints in 2019. 3,370 complaints were submitted to the Justice Ministry, including 2,500 in relation to domestic violence.
Tunisian civil society organizations urge the government to combat the phenomenon of violence against women in all its forms, including political and economic violence. Activists insisted on ending the prevailing climate of impunity by ensuring that the perpetrators are held accountable. Abdel Shawashi, CGTN, Tunis. Still on health matters, a study has revealed that a small number of malaria-infected school-aged children in eastern Uganda are responsible for the majority of malaria parasites circulating in local mosquitoes. Uganda has one of the highest number of annual deaths from malaria in Africa. Leon Sinyange reports. The two-year research analyzed measurements of how often children in Toro in the eastern part of Uganda are bitten by infected mosquitoes. The findings showed that some children aged 5 to 15 years old could transmit the disease from humans to mosquitoes. Here we are trying to see if a mosquito bites this person in the natural setting. We need to get malaria from this person or not getting malaria from this person. So we uh, saw so what we did. Then after that, then we, of course, we now we tested the mosquitoes, see if they're carrying the parasites. And shockingly, we hear that most people who transmit to mosquitoes are people who are asymptomatic. The study was conducted in eastern Uganda, where malaria has continued to exist despite intensive malaria eradication programs. Specifically, there were four, four people in this study who were responsible for 80% of the mosquitoes that are infected. So these ones, we term them as fast because they are the people who transmitted the malaria most in the communities. According to the health ministry, Uganda registers 25,000 cases of malaria per day. Malaria remains a major public health problem in Uganda. Experts believe that the research could help bring forward better methods to eradicate the disease. Currently, Uganda is intensifying its malaria campaigns. 27 million mosquito nets are being distributed within 25 districts in the north and eastern parts of the country. We're working on, on efficiencies. We want to run more effective programs. We want to reduce malaria so that if there is less malaria, you need less, uh, less resources. Uganda is one of six African countries that account for more than half of all malaria cases worldwide. And over the past months, COVID-19 has caused substantial disruptions to services that are trying to battle the disease. Leon Sanyanga, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. The news continues on Africa Live. Our coverage continues as well. We got your business news coming up next. Here's a peek at the headlines. South Africa's unemployment insurance fund faces collapse. And Nigeria plans to ban fish imports in the next two years. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Welcome back to Africa Live. Thanks for your company. South Africa's Unemployment Insurance Fund has come under heavy pressure to support ailing businesses and employees affected by the COVID-19 lockdown. The Department of Labor has warned that any more relief could cripple the fund leaving millions of people without any relief at all. Our correspondent Sumitra Naidu reports. Last month, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced that the COVID-19 temporary employer-employee relief scheme would be extended to help those affected with their loss of income. $3.6 million has already been paid to those in need. But the Department of Labor, which oversees the Unemployment Insurance Fund, has warned that any more relief will cause the scheme to collapse. Initially, our budget for this was 40 billion for the initial three months period. And uh, consequently, the lockdown period was extended to where it is now. With the payments, we are at 54 
billion rands, which is almost 14 billion more. With the latest uh, extension from the 16th to the 15th of October, um, we had indicated that our ability to continue paying uh, the test benefit uh, is um, becoming uh, less and less. But labor unions believe it's critical to keep the relief scheme going, especially for businesses, so they can hold on to their employees and hire more staff. According to Statistics South Africa, 2 million people lost their jobs since the hard lockdown began in March. Unemployment in South Africa is now at 30.8 percent. What's going to happen now is that you have a situation where many of these employers who've been cooperating, trying to keep these workers in their books because they were partnering with, with labor and government through the UIF test fund, they are going to really let go of these workers because most of them have not reached the production levels where they can afford these workers. So what's going to happen, we are going to see more retrenchments because employers without a test fund, they are clear they are going to let go of some of these workers. To make matters worse, the temporary employer-employee relief scheme has been marred by fraud and corruption. Government put the scheme on hold for the Auditor General to investigate. The Unemployment Insurance Fund was struggling before COVID-19. The impacts of the virus has just exacerbated its problems. While the government is committing further funding, the Treasury is scrambling to find the money. The Finance Minister has already warned of a growing debt burden in South Africa. With the economy still in a deep recession and unemployment rising, South Africa finds itself in a very tight corner. Sumitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. The Nigerian government is stepping up efforts to revive all oil refineries in the country as it struggles to cope with the rising cost of importing refined fuel. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation now says it will begin the second phase of the rehabilitation of the Port Harcourt refinery in the first quarter of 2021. It targets to get all four refineries running by 2023. Here is CGTN's Deji Badmus with more on that story. The Port Harcourt refinery, which can process 210,000 barrels of oil per day, is Nigeria's biggest at the moment. But like the other three refineries, it's been operating well below its output capacity. In the past one year, all the refineries which are government-owned have been idle as they await maintenance. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation has announced it will begin maintenance works at the Port Harcourt refinery from early next year. We have lost so much time and opportunities to build all the refineries we could have built, to create all the jobs that could have been created. And in fact, we are positioned by geography to be able to supply all the petroleum products required in West and Central Africa. Nigeria's four refineries have a combined production capacity of 445,000 barrels of crude per day, which should be sufficient to meet around 70% of daily domestic demand. But with the refineries not operational, the country has been forced to import petrol for its domestic consumption. And this has come at a very huge economic cost. So we have a very unfortunate situation where we take crude oil from the ground in Nigeria and we create wealth for several countries where these products are shipped, refined and brought back to us. Getting the Port Harcourt refinery up and running would help the country cut down on petrol imports and help it conserve much needed foreign exchange in the process. In a marked departure from the past, the NNPC says that once it revives the refinery, it will get private investors to run it rather than sell the facility. Labor unions in the country are strongly opposed to any plan to sell the refineries. When you talk about a PPP arrangement, definitely. I mean, it is the best virtually everywhere. The government can come in from one angle, then the private investors can come in. If we cross-fertilize that knowledge and idea in the interest of Nigeria and also the private investors, definitely it will be a win-win situation. The rehabilitation of the refinery is coming at a time when work is nearing completion at the privately owned 650,000 barrels per day Dangote refinery in Lagos. The refinery is expected to come on stream in 2021, while the four government operated refineries are expected to be fully operational in 2023.
So if all goes according to plan, Nigeria could actually move from being a net importer of refined fuels, including petrol, to be a big exporter of the final product. Deji Badmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. Meanwhile, Nigeria has announced plans to ban fish imports in the next two years. You heard correctly. The West African nation spends over $1 billion importing fish annually. But the country is now focusing on boosting local production. CGTN's Kalechi Mekalam reports. Fresh, smoked, dried, frozen. Kado Fish Market in Nigeria's capital is the one-stop hub for all kinds of fish. An average 10,000 tons of fish is offloaded here daily. Fish is the most accessible source of protein in Nigeria, but only 30% is produced locally and the other 70% is imported. But the government is considering a ban on fish imports by 2022. If you say you want to ban fish, how many fish are you which and you must first of all tell Nigerian the type of fish you want to ban and what are the substitutes? What are the alternatives to those fish? Do we have them? And if we don't have them, you cannot ban what you don't have, what you don't produce. You must have those products before you, you, you ban. If you don't, then you are going to cause more damage to the economy. You must first of all identify the fish that is, um, the common man can afford. It is when we do that, then you can say, yes, we can now decide to ban fish. We have arrived. Nigeria has a huge annual fish demand of about 3.6 million metric tons. Local production amounts to 1.1 million metric tons. Report from the country's central bank shows that every year, Nigeria spends $1.2 billion on fish imports. So experts see the import ban as a welcome development. It's going to have a great effect on the local fish production. Fisheries um, value chain is very huge, from production to processing, and processing to value addition, from value addition to packaging, and then to the retailing. So it's going to have a lot of effect um, in creating jobs and employment and even boost, boosting um, local GDP if proper strategies are put in place um, to caution the effect um, that is going to happen after the ban. Initiating a ban on the importation of fish is just one step. However, there are other factors to be considered. Um, you need to ensure that these uh, small-scale farmers that made up the, um, the major fish producer in Nigeria are trained on good agricultural practice. Um, they, are, um, they, have, they have access to capital to expand their fish production. Youth are made up of um, over 60% of the workforce in Nigeria. Uh, you need to encourage these youth that do not have any source of living um, to come into fish production. Um, you also need to increase um, value addition. Because even when they produce, um, we still have um, wastage in the um, fish sector. And so you need to increase or um, make them have access to um, local improved technology in terms of um, 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 fish processing. Fisheries sector contributes about 4.5% to the national GDP. Experts project the figures could rise by 10% if the problems of insecurity and weak infrastructure are tackled. Although it's still a long way to closing the demand gap in the fisheries sector, experts believe boosting local production is a step in the right direction. Kilichi Emekalam, CGTN Abuja, Nigeria. Let's look at a measure just approved by the U.S. House that aims to open the auditor's books of foreign companies listed on, listed on American exchanges. The U.S. Senate in May passed the U.S. Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act that widely viewed, that's widely viewed as an effort to stop Chinese companies from trading in the U.S. Our Roy Ruttenberg has more from Washington. Well, among other things, the Hold Foreign Companies Accountable Act requires non-American publicly traded firms to submit to annual audits by a U.S. regulatory board. Failure to comply three years in a row would result in automatic delisting from American stock exchanges. This common sense bill does nothing more than ensure a level playing field by requiring foreign issuers to play by the same rules as everyone else. Well, the Senate's version passed in May after China's Luckin Coffee revealed that it had overinflated 2019 sales by some $300 million. That revelation crashed Luckin's stock price here in the U.S. 
and the company was booted from the Nasdaq stock exchange over the summer. Wednesday's vote was streamlined thanks to a special protocol that essentially blocks debate and amendments when there's clear bipartisan support. Analysts say it'll most likely be signed by President Trump given his confrontational position on China. Chinese giants like Alibaba and Baidu may soon find themselves out of American stock markets if they don't comply with the audits. Remember, Chinese firms raised $12 billion in IPOs in the U.S. just this year alone. This bill is not anti-China and it is not designed to prohibit the trading of Chinese companies. Well, now, this is not a new issue. U.S.-China tensions over audits stem back some 20 years. Chinese officials have criticized the bill, saying it'll harm U.S. capital markets. A top official from China's Securities Regulatory Commission recently suggested it would all get worked out under a Biden administration. Fang Xinghai saying it's not an intractable problem. Roe Ruttenberg, CGTN in Washington. And we're not done just yet. We've got a lot more coming your way. Here's a peek at the headline. Zimbabwe turns to the silver screen to raise awareness about wildlife conservation and fight poaching. Beleza Marcio Lopes has been practicing and teaching capoeira in Cape Town since 1999. Originally developed by slaves in Brazil in the 16th century, capoeira is a mix of dance, gymnastic performance, and martial art, and is practiced around the world. Despite setbacks, Beleza continues to hold on to his dream of celebrating the heritage of African slaves through this unique form. journeys, the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ugh. So let's explore. CGTN, see the difference. Accra is my kind of city. That's because when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home in Lagos or Abidjan, which are two of the major cities I grew up in. After about a decade covering business news on the continent, I've learned it's all about the high risk, but also the high returns and the high energy. You simply have to adjust in order to keep pace. When I started out as a journalist, my dream was to open people's minds to the different perspectives. From the CEO in the boardroom to the trader out in the street, we all have different stories. From Accra to Addis Ababa, from Cairo to Cape Town, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Here at CGTN, we realize that Africa is on the move, and it's moving fast, but we're moving right along with it. I'm Uchiyo Koronkwa, and I'm a business anchor and reporter at CGTN. Welcome back to Africa Live. Thanks for your company. Zimbabwe is using the silver screen to fight poaching and raise awareness about wildlife conservation. An award-winning feature film that highlights the high risk of poaching has premiered at cinemas in the country, and there are plans to have the film shown to rural communities. CGTN's Brian Wakatuya has that story. This was not the life I imagined for myself. But my choices had led me there. 
down on his luck, Sulu turns to poaching and finds himself facing the consequences of his actions. Gonare Jo's writer, Sidney Taibabashe, hopes this story will deter those tempted by the promise of quick riches. Most of the people don't know, they just think uh, game, uh, game rangers will just play hide and seek with them in the game parks, but there's, an order, there's a shoot to kill uh, order that's there. If you get in the game parks, it's shoot to kill. So you have to know what's waiting for you if you decide to do it. Taibabashe began writing the story in 2013 after the cyanide poisoning of over 300 elephants in Wange National Park. He wants to strike a blow against the international networks behind the illicit trade. All these syndicates, they can't get the rhino horn if they don't end up talking to the guy who lives next to the game park. So the guy who lives next to the game park is the one who gets into the game park and brings the rhino horn outside of the game park and it goes on from there. So this film is also targeted at those people when they see what really happens when you get into those game parks, they might think twice before doing it. So when you cut the chain there, it might be difficult for them now to, to find the people to actually go into the game parks to do the dirty work for them. It's hoped that a movie will have more impact than traditional conservation promotion platforms. Documentaries t tend to tell a linear story. They often are speaking to the converted um, and they often are inaccessible to many people. So although they're outstanding and they, they, they give us a sort of message, uh, they're not cutting across the, the demographics of the community. By contrast, a film like Gone Rizzo tells many layers of the story. So you can hear the story from many sides. You get caught up in the emotion. Gona Rejo won the Best Feature Narrative at the 2020 Pan-African Film Festival, an achievement that will help the local industry. Film in Zimbabwe isn't that big, though there's no support in terms of like financially and in terms of policies. I think this is the beginning of, um, of people realizing what film can bring to, to, to the table. Konare Joe has premiered at cinemas in three cities here, but now plans are underway to have public viewings in rural communities so that its message can reach as many people as possible. Farai Makutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. Stay tuned to Africa Live. We've got your sports news coming up next. Here's a look at what's coming.